All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kurt Perkins. I'm the Assistant Executive Director for Corporate Partnerships with the ABCA. Since 1945, the ABCA has been bringing great coaching minds together to educate, mentor, guide, and support the greatest game in the world. We're excited that you joined us tonight, and we have a great webinar brought to you by ABC Convention Exhibitor and Partner Swift. A few things to note, a copy of tonight's webinar will be uploaded to the ABCA video library tomorrow via abc.org. We'd also like this webinar to be interactive, so feel free to post comments and questions in the chat box, and we'll be sure to get to those uh, towards the end of the webinar. Tonight, you're gonna get a great behind the scenes look at the exact playbook the most successful baseball and softball facilities in the U.S. are using to level up their business. These are practical tips and strategies that, with the right scheduling, software powering your business, you'll be able to implement and achieve similar results. We have incredible presenters to talk about this, starting with Jeet Mehta, co-founder and CEO of Swift. This is going to be an action-packed seminar. We can't wait to get started. So take it away, Jeet. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, nice to meet everyone wherever you're tuning in from. First thing that I want to get you guys engaged with is just drop the city or location that you guys are tuning in from. We have people even in this call here from Toronto, uh, North Carolina, LA. Uh, super excited to see everyone here. Let's just jump right in. Here's a quick rundown of how this call is going to go. So I'll spend a very short amount of time giving you guys a bit of backstory, who I am, what I know about running a facility, why you should listen to me. And I'll quickly also touch on some of the problems that I've seen so many of these facility owners face. And I'm guessing a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about there will hit home hard with you guys. But really most of the call, I wanna focus on what you're here to listen to, which is practical strategies and tips on how you can counter those problems and ultimately make more money with less time. I will then pass it off to Kevin and Jared from The Five, and they'll talk about how they're using some of these tactics as well as a, you know, a really heavy numbers driven approach um, to just crush it, uh, regardless of what time of year it is. And then finally, we'll wrap up with questions. Um, and you know, you can, you can start adding those in the chat as the talk goes on and we'll cover them at the end. All right. So very quick intro. I won't spend too much time here. I just want to sort of convey who I am, what do I know and why you should listen to me. Um, so like, uh, like Kurt mentioned, my name is Jeet Mehta. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Swift app. We're based out of Toronto, but most of our business is in baseball and softball in the U S we are an operating system for your facility. We do everything from online booking, scheduling, staff accounts, email, SMS, reports, payroll, you name it. And the product is getting better and better every week. So, but the reason I'm telling you this is because we started this company from my background as an athlete. So for context, uh, this is like where I show some embarrassing baby pictures. I was born in India. We moved over to Canada when I was six years old. Uh, you can see there below, that's my dad. He played cricket professionally in India. Sounds a lot cooler when you're in India or Australia than saying that here, but it was cool there. Um, and so when my brother and I grew up, he got, you know, obviously he got us into the sport. Eventually I did well enough myself to play for the Canadian national cricket team, which is a real thing, believe it or not. Um, but the reason I'm telling you guys this story is because like everyone on this call, I've grown up almost every day spending hours and hours in facilities that look like this. Um, and the reason we started Swift was because my coach and the owner of the facility that I was training at was the one that was really struggling. Running his business profitably was very hard for him. And every day he was spending, drowning in emails, calls, and messages instead of doing what he loved, which was actually spending time in the cage. And he had this little book that he would like write all his bookings on. It was, he was, he was a bit of a mess. And he was the first one that reached out asking for help because everything he had looked for online wasn't sort of suiting what he was looking for. So I'll sort of just touch on some of the problems that he had. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar. Maybe drop a plus one uh, or an emoji in the chat or a plus 1,000 if something really hits home with you. Um, here are some of the problems that my coach was facing and maybe some of you guys are facing this. So first off, you're probably, you know, syncing hours on the phone or on the computer every week, either you or your staff, um, to manage bookings and answer calls and emails from parents and athletes. And it's a mess because you're, you have lessons, camps, programs, clinics, membership payments, rentals, all that stuff. And you're trying to sort of manage it all on the phone and computer. Um, and the one thing is like, you could, you could take these calls yourself or you could hire someone, but again, that eats into your margins. And the whole point of this talk is profitability. Also generally people that you hire front desk tend to be younger high school kids or college kids and training them is tough. You know, what happens if they make a mistake? How long are they going to be around for? And if they're not around for long, how often do you have to keep retraining these kids? 
And then on top of that, if you want to really get, you know, into sort of the high revenue, high ticket items with like clinics, programs, and lessons, you got to find coaches. And then that is its own challenge because they have their own availability, it changes week over week. And again, it's on you to track and make sure that that's all there for your customers. And then finally, everyone on this call knows how seasonal the sports business is. Fall and winter are amazing and spring and summer are tough, especially here in the North. Uh, if you're in the Northeast, you'll resonate hard with this. Um, a common tactic is to offer memberships, but again, that brings its own pains of tracking payments and so on. And then finally, on top of all these problems, you got to figure out how to pay rent. Interest rates are not being kind to anyone right now. Um, and then grow your business. So there's, you know, should you buy that new rap soto? Should you invest in hit tracks? Should you put out videos on Instagram? Is TikTok the new hot thing? What's going to help the most and how are you going to find out what that is and how to implement it? So if any of that, you know, if you relate to it, drop it in the emoji and I will definitely take a look as the call goes on. The best part about the software company that we've started is that through it, we've gotten an exposure to so many different kinds of facilities from, you know, the 2000 square foot barn where, you know, in a rural town where it's a mom and pop, the, both parents have a full time job to an 8,000 square foot location in an urban location. And then finally to a franchise with you know 10 plus locations, 30,000 square feet. And in this process, we've probably talked to maybe 500, 600 facility owners. And it's interesting that despite the variance in their size and how they run their business, there is a pattern that emerges from the ones that are doing well and the ones that aren't. Now, you'd be surprised at what that pattern is. It is not what you'd expect. Um, you know, The common things that people point to are of course, square footage, what kinds of machines they have, what kinds of trainers and coaches they have on staff, how long they've been in business. All of these things do matter. I, I don't deny that these are important factors in how well your business does. But at the very like at the very tail end of it, what it really comes down to is an intense focus on profitability and time, which is can you make more money per unit time? That's what is like a true measure of how efficient your business is and will ultimately determine the cap of your facility's revenue capabilities. And again, Kevin and Jared will touch on this in a much more quantitative manner, but um, that's sort of the pattern that we've seen. And that's why all of us here on the call, we wanna learn from the folks that are doing it well. What I will say though, is that the advice that we're gonna share here is simple, not easy. So what I mean by that is it will make sense and it'll, you know, you can easily see how, you know, it would impact your business but it's not gonna be easy to implement. There will be action on your end. You know, you can hear the best advice in the world, but ultimately it comes down to you taking that leap of faith and, and taking those actions to then reap the rewards. Cool, so let's dive into it. Just a disclaimer here. I think it's important to establish the difference between strategies and tactics. Uh, the way I see it is like strategies are sort of the foundation. It's ways that you think about your business, it's high level. And sometimes it seems a bit wishy-washy, but without it, the tactics that, you know, the very specific, oh, like I want to upsell them on this membership in this manner, those tactics won't mean anything until you know why you're doing those things. So we'll start with five, you know, basic strategies that should inform how you think about your business. And then from there, we'll jump into very specific tactics. So first of all, the first and the most common change I recommend to every sports facility owner we talk about is online, mobile, and cashless. Folks, it's 2023. You should not be sending people, your customers, to sites that look like this. We are not in the 90s anymore, and it is important that you, you your, play, your players, your athletes, your parents are able to make bookings and pay on their phone. Um, and it should be smooth and easy. And the way to do this is, again, this requires a bit of behavior change. It, it is tough, and sometimes you'll get customers that will sort of like be upset at this. But you need to be relentless in that anytime anyone calls, emails, or texts you, the general advice that you give them should be to send them online. Now, this doesn't mean that you're not going to accept walk-ins. Like Walk-ins are still a part of the business. But the, the more you make a habit of sending people online, the more you decouple your, your presence from your ability to make money. And that's what you want because uh, having people establish a habit of going online means that you can make money when you're on vacation, when you're asleep or when you're not at the facility. And that's what it comes down to. And that's how you get a highly profitable business. So um, I won't touch into which tools look like this. You guys have seen the market, but I think it's important that you understand what your experience is that you're providing your clients and make sure that that's uh, smooth and easy. Now, the second part of this is mobile. So 
I mean, we've seen this on our platform uh, across tons of facilities, 90, 95% plus of the bookings that parents, players, and athletes are doing are on their phone. Again, this is a minimum expectation in 2023 that even the most non-tech parents and grandparents have smartphones and they expect to be able to do things on that phone. So uh, I think Google has a stat where like 70% of the shopping that's done on the internet is done on the phone. So I, if you are not sort of leaning into that, I think that is a mistake uh, for your business. And the more you can lean in that direction, the better it'll be for your top line as well as your bottom line. Now, this is a bit of a sidebar, but I think it's important. A lot of times I speak to the sports facility owners and the first thing they tell me is like, geez, I'm not a tech guy. Like, I don't know anything about tech. I'm in it for baseball and just help me run my business. So I get it. Everyone here is a sports person, uh, including myself. But you're also running a business. So I think it's important to get a bit geeky sometimes to understand how you can improve your business. And the most important mental model I can pass to you guys is this idea of funnels. So if you ever worked a corporate job or you're familiar with digital marketing or tech, you will know what this is, but I think it's still important to iterate. So a funnel is basically at the very top, you have your end customer, the player, parent, and athlete visiting your website or hearing about you. So that's like the, the first time they are attentive to what you offer, right? And as they get deeper, the funnel gets narrower. So maybe a hundred people will learn about you through Google, but then 50 of them will actually browse your website. So that's the second part in the funnel here. It says interest, client browses what you offer. And then maybe half of them will end up creating an account, which is that they've actually expressed some desire to do something at your business. And then finally the action, the, the money maker, that's what we all want, which is the client makes a purchase. And of course there's repetition here now because the client will then come back and, and make more purchases. But the reason I'm explaining this is because it's important to think about your business in these funnels and actually map out even roughly, you don't need numbers for this, but map out where your, your players and parents are falling through the cracks. So at the very top, is your website easy to understand? Is it easy to navigate? Can they easily use it on their phone? Is it easy to understand what you offer and how much you charge? And then you go deeper. Um, at what point do you ask them to create an account and how much work is it to create an account? A lot of times people will get hit with, if you go on a, a baseball facilities website and you click book now, it'll take you immediately to a login page. And the problem with that is that as a business, you haven't delivered any value yet, but you're asking for a lot in return for them to create an account. And that seems like a minor detail, but I know from the, the Fives experience as well as from our other facilities, little details like that make a big difference in the number of new clients that start visiting your business and making purchases. And then finally, uh, we'll talk about cash. Uh, I think a core fundamental or a tenet of the businesses that do well on our platform and across, across other, other platforms as well is online payments. So cash is great. We all understand the benefits of cash, but, um, it does pose a major problem, which is that it requires tracking. And so, again, I talked about, um, this idea of decoupling your presence from your, the amount of money you can make. And part of that is getting rid of cash, especially for one-off or recurring payments that you see online where people are buying memberships, buying packages, buying lessons, getting access to camps, those things you should drive as much as possible to be online. You do miss out a little bit on the benefits of the cash, but what's important here is that now no one has to, you don't need a physical presence in the facility to, to check whether that person paid for their booking or not. Even if it's Venmo, now you need to sort of think about like, okay, have they sent me the Venmo yet? Uh, if not, how do I keep track of that? Et cetera, et cetera. So what's important here to note is like for a large portion of your business, I think cashless makes sense with traveling teams, organizations, leagues, and the bigger ticket items. I think you can still go with cash and that's totally fine. So I'm not denying that cash has a very important place in these businesses, but the more you lean into cashless, again, the more you'll start decoupling your ability to make money from your ability to be in the facility. So just, again, I'll, I'll sort of talk about these strategies and then I'll show you how we sort of take care of it for you. The strategies are tool agnostic, so you don't need to worry about that, but I'll just mention here, every facility of ours gets access to a branded booking link that looks incredible on the phone. People will be able to go and make bookings directly on that page. They'll be able to see when you're open. And the important thing here to note is that as they go through the process, we don't hit them with a clunky calendar page. All we do is let them pick the date pick the duration and we will generate open slots for them. A lot of times I've seen folks get hit with a calendar page and the problem with calendars is one, they show a lot of unnecessary information. You know, if you're coming in the evening, you don't care what's going on in that cage at 8 a.m. in the morning. 
And the other reason is calendars are just clunky on mobile, to be honest. You end up scrolling sideways and vertically and zooming in. The other piece of this is you saw that we actually present a lot of value first before asking them to make an account. So uh, we show them what they have available. We show them the price. Once they're invested in the journey, then we ask them to create an account. And the account creation is also passwordless. So think of us as Amazon or any other platform. And our goal here is to make the checkout process as simple and easy as possible. Leaning into that is also saving credit cards, right? You don't, you're hoping that the person's going to come back many times. You don't want them to re-enter the same credit card 30 times. So Swift again, takes care of that for you in that we save the card on file, they pay and confirm. And at that point they get a confirmation text as well as an email with a receipt, all the details of their booking, a calendar invite shows so that shows up in Google calendar. And you guys as the owners and the staff members also get notified in that process. So again, I think the advice here is meant to be educational. Of course, I have a vested interest in telling you about this advice, but I think you can take a lot of this advice, regardless of what tool you're using, if you're willing to put in the work. We just try to you know, obfuscate as much of that work for you as much as possible. Second strategy I'll talk about, and I'll try and move a bit quickly here, is think about self-serve. So again, leaning into how can I sort of question every touch point or interface between me and my customers and figure out, do I need to be there for that touch point or can that be automated? Classic example of this is cancellations and reschedules. Oftentimes people will have, uh, and one of the fears they have with online booking is that, you know, if I offer uh, online booking, they might cancel and then they won't show up. Now I lost that time that I could have offered to someone else. Very valid concern. Again, Swift sort of takes care of this for you with a cancellation policy where they're not going to be able to get a refund if they try and cancel within a certain time period. But more importantly, you should use a tool that allows the customer to be able to cancel and reschedule on their own. So again, we take care of that for you. The athlete will have their own profile. They'll be able to view their past bookings, cancel, reschedule, download receipts, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole point is our goal here is one, to give them a good experience, the player, parent, and athlete, but two, for you guys, we don't want them calling you all the time. And I think as a business owner myself, and as you guys being business owners, I can appreciate when my customers are happy and they're not calling in. And that's sort of the experience that we want to enable for you guys and your facilities as well. Number three, big thing, and I put it here three times, it's similar to real estate, location, location, location. For businesses, it's recurring revenue, recurring revenue, and recurring revenue. I cannot stress the importance of this more than I already am. And if you aren't offering memberships, it is the highest leverage addition you can make to your business. Again, Kevin and Jared will attest to this later in the call, but the sports business is extremely seasonal, but it doesn't have to be. All the top grossing facilities, guys that are making 50, 60, 70, 80K a month, uh, and again, square footage and stuff does matter, but it's more about how they think about their business that leads to that kind of result. Um, they all run memberships. One of the common fears with memberships is, hey, if I offer a membership with unlimited rentals or unlimited lessons, now they're going to come in and eat valuable cage time that, that I could have given to a traveling team or org. Again, very valid fear, but the right software will take care of that for you. You'll be able to assign credits so that they can only do two free rentals a week or two free rentals a month. And you can see here that when clients come in to book memberships at this facility, we try our best to make sure that they sign up for this membership. So we actually have the see benefits button where they'll be able to see at a glance the discounts and benefits that they're going to get by joining this membership. Once they feel confident, they'll go ahead. It's only three clicks because the credit card's already saved on file and they're good to go. And the discounts that they get are applied automatically on their next purchase. So it's important that you lean into recurring revenue. And if they, if you do have concerns, try and work around them because Again, I cannot stress how important this is. Facilities that are crushing it, memberships is a big portion of why they are doing as well as they are. Fourth, um, prime time. So I, I think like one of the biggest like determinants of how well a business does, especially a brick and mortar business where you're, if you think about the sports facility business, what you're selling is time in the facility, right? So one way to think about this is, am I getting the maximum bang or revenue per unit time sold. And the most important times are weeknights and weekends, especially during fall and school season. Um, how you deal with that time will make a big difference to your bottom and top line. And what I can say here in terms of the patterns that I've seen, and it does make sense, is that prioritize the big ticket items first. So leagues, tournaments, and traveling teams should get preference on weeknights, especially during the winter where it's really busy. 
Uh, don't let some kid book out a cage from 6 to 7 p.m. in February on a, on a Wednesday and, and have that sort of cage blocked off from, from a team, a local team being able to come and practice because your big ticket items are going to be larger invoices and those are the ones that you want to prioritize first. So typically the way I've seen it done well is big ticket items first. So traveling teams, leagues, and organizations. Then you take whatever time's left and fill it with camps, clinics, and programs. Again, those are you know, higher revenue than a one-off cage rental. Then whatever time is left after that, you fill it up with private lessons. And then whatever time's left after that, you fill it with individual cage rentals. And, and for all of these services, make sure that you're giving members some sort of benefit, um, whether that's a discount, whether that's credits. Um, and a good way to sort of think about how well you're doing here is keep track of revenue per space per hour. And again, you'll you'll learn about this more a bit later, but there are some key metrics that you can sort of monitor uh, as you make these changes and really see how the impact is on your business. Um, I had a conversation with US Indoor, uh, which is another conference, uh, not specific to baseball, but specific to sports facilities broadly. And the, the, the director there, Chuck, he said something that really stuck with me, which was time doesn't sit on the shelf. And what he meant by that was, if you think about a grocery store, they put food or a clothing store, whatever, they have inventory that sits there and they're allowed to let it sit before they can sell it. When you're in the facility business, your inventory is your time and you cannot, it, it rots. As soon as the time is gone, it's gone. You're not getting that time back. So it's important that you figure out how to make the most of that time. And I, I think Chuck said something like this offhand. He was like, people that are purposely leaving time on their facility for some reason makes no sense to him. He wants to slap them. So he was that passionate, but I understand where he's coming from. Related to managing prime time is also multiple uses for your facility. So again, if you're a baseball softball facility, some of these will come naturally to you. You know, you might have a soft toss cage. You might split up the cage into two. You might have retractable cages and you'll open up the turf. Uh, those multiple uses make sense, but you can sort of take it a step further. And again, a good metric to track here is revenue per square foot. It's Square footage agnostic, if you have an 8,000 square foot space versus a 3,000 square foot space, you can still use this metric to see how well you're doing. And there's a lot of creative ideas that you can come up with. So I talked about some of the basic ones that you guys probably all are already using, um, but you can get a bit more clever. You can include, uh, obviously, machines. You can add a weight room. You can add, we have physiotherapy and recovery rooms at some of our facilities where they'll get trainers and do dry needling sessions. And that's like another another source of revenue for them. You can do birthday party rentals. If you have a little office or a little room, you can rent it out for teams, for meeting rooms, um, corporate, you know, offsite building, like team building events. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do here, all the way to homeschooling and after school programs. The whole goal here is to make sure that your facility is busy as much as possible and with the right kind of customers. Um, and again, to, just to touch on Swift, you'll see on the right there, there's a room hierarchy. There's the facility. The facility has an open turf and the open turf has a bunch of cages. The reason for that is because I've grown up in these facilities myself and we used to do this all the time. I actually have practice tomorrow uh, where we would open up the cages for fielding and fitness and we would pull in the cages for hitting and pitching. Now, what that means is that there's an implicit hierarchy in the spaces in your facility so that if you offer a turf rental as well as an individual cage rental, the software that you use should automatically know that if someone books the turf rental, that the cages on the turf are now occupied and vice versa. If someone blocks off one cage, even if the other four cages are free, the turf can no longer be booked at that time. So again, you want to make sure that you're not having to do all this work yourself because that requires your presence, which requires your time, which means you're less profitable than you could be. So those are the strategies. I'll keep an eye out on the questions. So keep dropping your, your comments in your chat uh, in the chat and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll tackle them at the end. Um, the last, last strategy here that I'll mention is training time. So I spoke about the, the, the challenges with hiring, especially, you know, the, the crowd that you hire is generally younger with after COVID, there's a bit of a labor shortage. Hiring is a lot harder than it used to be. So you should try and use as much as possible a tool that is so simple that it's, close to impossible to make mistakes um, because the less room for mistakes, that means the less you're involved. And, and again, by extension, the more money you can make. Um, at Swift, one of the core ways we do this is with our calendar page, which is open on most facilities, monitors or TV screens at all times. The biggest thing about this calendar, especially folks coming from some older tools, they get their mind blown over the fact that it's drag and drop. 
Um, and that that simple little addition makes such a big difference in how often you need to train your staff members and how quickly they get up to speed on the tool. Everything from moving bookings, canceling bookings to creating bookings is all drag and drop. And it's dead simple, which is why generally when we bring facilities on, it's literally an hour of onboarding and, and they're good to go. Um, all right, so let's let's get a bit more tactical now. And I'm I know I'm moving quickly, but I do want to make sure that there's time for questions as well as as well as for Kevin and Jared to do their thing. Um, let's get really tactical now. I'll talk about five things that I've seen work really well at the facilities that are on our platform. The first one being a coach's membership. So I don't think this gets used enough, and I don't know why, but I, I think it's such a great idea to explore. And it is a new revenue stream that I think a lot of facilities can think about. So Oftentimes, memberships are either reserved for individual players or for traveling team members. But I think what gets missed is coaches that aren't on your roster, but you often see them in your facility renting cages. So the canonical example is you have three coaches that you pay through 1099s uh, and you have your facility and people are coming in and, and doing rentals. But sometimes you'll see another college athlete come in and just book, rent cages at your facility. So from your perspective, it's just a rental but he's bringing his own clientele or she's bringing their own clientele uh, to then do lessons. So what I would suggest is something you can look into is going up to that coach. If you see them often, go up to them and offer them a monthly coach's membership. And so the coach would pay 150, 25, whatever, based on your area, some monthly fee to then be added to your roster. And what that'll give them is visibility to clients that are not theirs. So uh, I'll just show you an example. When people go book lessons on Swift, um, they, you know, they can choose a lesson and multiple instructors can teach a given lesson, in which case they'll be able to choose between instructors based on when they're next available. So that's the roster that I, that I think you can sell to people that are coming off into your facility, but that are not on as a contractor. You can tell them that, Hey, if you want additional clientele, pay me a hundred dollars a month, I'll add you to my Swift account as a, as a valid instructor. And then you will be front and center along with all my other coaches and be able to make uh, more, more money. And then for you guys, again, obviously the benefits are clear. It's recurring revenue. Second thing, upselling memberships. So Kevin and Jared are, are killers at this. I think they do a really good job of this. The, like I said, the most important thing you can do is get recurring revenue. So a way to do that is drive clients when they come in. Okay. Let's say, uh, you know, Joe Smith comes in for a hitting lesson for his second time. So you've noticed that he's come in once. Now he's come in for the second time. Maybe he's coming for a third time. He's paying 50 bucks or 60 bucks. When he comes to the counter and he tries to pay, or if he's already paid online, you can reach out to him and say, look, I know you've been in for a couple months. Why don't we just transfer that $50 that you paid towards the $125 a month membership that we offer? And then you can come as many times as you want. And you're only paying $50 more. Um, that sort of, those are the ways that you can push people towards recurring revenue. And most likely if they're getting value from your facility, they're not going to just cancel the next month. So the lifetime value of these customers is very high as long as you're providing value. And it's, it's almost like in your and their best interest to drive them towards those subscriptions. Um, and again, through Swift, you can do this easily through the admin portal. You'll be able to, uh, you know, each customer will have their own profile and you'll be able to assign the membership. Let's say they're in front of you. You'll be able to assign the membership easily right there. Maybe even add a coupon code if you want so that you're subsidizing their membership for them. The card would already be saved on file. You can just assign and they're good to go. Another thing I'll do, again, from the Fives Playbook and a lot of the other facilities that are doing well, and they have an infinite set of these tactics. So I'm just giving you guys a teaser of what, what you can do with your facility, um, which is create scarcity right? The reason luxury stores don't have price tags and the reason that they have drops instead of having inventory constantly available is that it creates, it sort of piques the interest of the athletes and parents. And so another thing you can try is have some set of memberships and then just announce that your memberships are now sold out for the month and you're not taking any more additional members and set up a wait list where they can go sign, sign up for that wait list and, and join, join sort of the, the queue to, add, you know, be, become a member the next month. And now you have data, you can go reach out, you can figure out why they want to join a member membership and then sort of sell to them in a more personal manner instead of having them just willy nilly like say no or say yes to your membership directly from your booking page. All right. Another really key tactic that I would suggest is performance programs and drop-in clinics. So 
if you're not already doing this, uh, it's a huge thing for a lot of our facilities is having, you know, of course, regular camps, like a, a classic one week spring break camp that, you know, a kid pays $200 and gets registered for all five days. But more importantly, you can do drop in stock clinics. So we've seen one of our facilities in Texas runs an open BP every Friday. It does really well. Um, you can run those kinds of programs where kids pay 30 bucks a session to drop in. You can have advanced hitting academies that people are paying per session. And then you can use your memberships to give them varying access to these things. So again, Swift takes care, care of this for you, but let's say you had a gold, silver, and a platinum membership. Each of those memberships might give you a different set of sessions per month for your drop-in clinic. So if you have an open BP running endlessly you know, throughout the year, you can have a, a, a silver membership that gives you two free sessions a month and anything beyond that you pay uh, $50. Okay. Then you have a, a platinum pack, uh, sorry, a, a gold package that gives you five free sessions a month and anything beyond that you pay 40 bucks per session. And then you have a platinum package where you get, you know, 10, 15 free sessions a month and anything beyond that you pay $20 per session. And what you want to do is gradually move customers up the tier. So you'll see clients come in and you'll see how engaged they are and you'll see how well they're doing. And there will naturally be a separation in the people that are interested in, in sort of getting more out of your facility and, and those that aren't. And you can generally just like massage them into these different tiers. And again, uh, it's more recurring revenue for you guys, but also at the end of the day, it's more value for your athletes and parents. And of course, we take care of that for you. When people go and book drop-in clinics, here's a high performance camp. It's $50 per session. You can view upcoming times. You can set age restrictions on those uh, on those sessions, and then you can join and you can see that each session has a participant limit. So it, it might be 20 spots per session and then certain sessions might sell out, but the other ones might still be running. Um, they can pay online and e easily register for those classes. Last thing I'll mention is packages. So in that hierarchy, I talked about traveling teams, organizations, and leagues taking precedence. Then it was camps, clinics, and programs. Then it was private lessons. And then it uh, semi-private and private lessons. And then it was individual rentals. But even in those last two things, you can still optimize further by instead of offering one-off rentals or one-off lessons, offer packages. So a classic example is like a six pack of cage rentals where if each cage rental was 50 bucks, the six pack package would be $275 instead of $300. So the customer is getting a bit of a discount and you're getting a stronger commitment and more revenue up front. That money stays in the business. It stays on file as credits. And then they can use those credits when they come to make bookings. Um, and again, Swift takes care of this for you. I'm, I'm sort of like sounding like a broken, broken record here, but they can, you can see in this GIF, they'll buy a five lesson pack, uh, gives them five credits. They can hit pay and confirm three clicks. Then they have the package. Now, the next time they go to make a booking for a lesson, you'll just see it come up here. It'll actually ask them at when they get to the checkout, instead of paying online, do you want to pay with credit? So you'll see that here, they'll pick a time for the lesson with Mike. Um, and once they picked a time, they'll go to the final summary screen. It'll say pay online or redeem credits. They'll redeem credits. This person already has two packages that they've bought. Once they use a credit, the price drops down to zero and they're good to go. So Swift, again, takes care of the credit tracking and redemption for you. So you don't have to do it yourself. Um, and the customer always is able to use those credits going forward. And you can get crazy here. I'll just add like, you know, you can have credits expire to create urgency and, and do all sorts of fun stuff. But I think the core tenant uh, remains true regardless of whether you do those things, which is try and store commitment on file. And then final bonus tip here. Um, Again, I know I've gone through this quickly, but think about raising your prices. Uh, regardless of what, if even if you're in a rural town with 2,000 people and we have customers like that, I always suggest as, as a business owner, you're going to doubt yourself more than you think your customers will. And I, again, I'm guilty of this myself, even for the software, I think we're underpriced, where you will set a price for yourself that you think, oh, maybe it's that's that's okay. Like maybe that's good enough. Try and push the barrier there and raise your prices by $5, by $10, whatever it might be. And you will be surprised at one, the willingness to pay from your customers, but two, what signal a high price actually sends. Because oftentimes people think that, oh, if I'm the cheapest in the town, then they'll come to me. But how many decisions do you make on your daily life that you optimize for the lowest thing? Sometimes a high price signals high value. 
And if you feel confident in the value that you can deliver to your customers, then I would strongly recommend raising those prices. So that's it. Uh, you know, super quick rundown on five strategies and five tactics that, you know, should change the way you think about your business. Of course, Swift takes care of all that for you, but I will now pass it off to Kevin and Jared, because I think they have a lot of really interesting insight uh, into crushing it with sports facility businesses. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, G. You know, it's been a, it's been a pleasure, pleasure working with you guys and uh, it's exciting stuff. A lot of those tactics, you know, it's been fun bouncing, bouncing uh, those things off of you guys and, and having the capabilities to actually uh, apply them. But uh, so yeah, my name is, my name is Kevin Chandler. This is Jared Yamasaki. Um, we are uh, partners in um, the five baseball facility we're out in Encino, Los Angeles, but uh, we're also partners in a, in a few other things. But a little bit about my background. Um, I uh, played baseball at UC Santa Barbara, studied um, studied behavioral sciences and, and technology management, and then uh, got kind of full force into the startup realm. And uh, Jared went to... Uh, University of uh, Southern California, studied neuroscience, uh, pretty sharp partner to have. And uh, we actually, before we, we got the facility rolling, um, we we started a robotics company. So that's where our initial relationship, we grew up together, didn't talk much, re rekindled when we, we found out we we're both in the startup realm. And, and that's how we reconnected, uh, ended up being presented an opportunity to uh, partner up uh, start a baseball facility and and um, you know it's been cool we've we've implemented a lot of uh, strategies highly leveraged software and automation and create systems to allow us to substantially scale the facility while starting a robotics company we also invest in some uh, commercial real estate as well so um, but yeah without uh, without further ado um, you know we'll kind of tell you guys a little bit about um, where we we're at before uh swift and and kind of where we're at now and and some of the strategies that we use and and we'll try to keep it as simple and easy to follow as possible um and you know this is a there's conversations we can talk hours and hours but we're going to show you some of the the main things um that that highlight our our success that we've had and and um you know the first conversation that we've had with uh some other friends that own other facilities that have allowed them to scale as well so um pretty pretty swift um we're using a different software, uh, pretty outdated. Didn't allow us to uh, to automate much, and we were stuck. Uh, we've been open coming up on two years now. We were stuck at uh, about twenty thousand dollars a month for probably four four ish months, and it was like, what the heck's going on? Like, where what are we doing with our time? Um, and you know, time is extremely valuable to us. You know, for us, it's to to grow other companies. Um, for a lot of other people, it's uh to be able to spend more time with their families, um, you know, have more free time to do whatever, whatever they want. But so we were stuck about $20,000 um, and all of our time was going towards scheduling. I'm sure every other facility owner that's in this, uh, in this webinar right now uh, knows that it's a never ending game of Tetris and communication with, with every single person involved. And it's a, uh, it's not a fun game to play. And uh, frankly, it's a waste of time and it doesn't allow you to focus on the things that actually uh, that matter and, and allow you to allow you to scale. So, uh, we launched we launched with Swift in March. Um, since March, we've scaled up to uh, we just hit an eighty thousand dollar mark uh, last month, and then um, we're on pace for one hundred twenty plus. And uh, you know it's been a pretty pretty awesome experience. But you know, uh, want to kind of kick it off. I'll have Jared run through one of the very simple um, math equations that we use, and and something you know. Kind of speaking with other facility owners, um, and what we've what we've come to realize is, you know, a lot a lot of people aren't setting goals, and they're not doing the the simple math on on how to get there. And and these simple rules apply to facilities, applies to every other business. And if you're able to really understand them, um, it gives you direction, uh, allows you to create other systems to to automate the whole process. And you know, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's extremely powerful and it's it's a high point of leverage. So um, I'm gonna hop over to the whiteboard here. I'll Jerry take it away for a minute. All right, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Sweet. So uh, one of the things, right, uh, tr transitioning over to Swift, Swift opened up a lot of time uh, for us to even create these kind of frameworks for ourselves. And 
also provided a system for us to to be able to uh, to capture some of this data. So one of the uh, things that we like to visit, we call it our uh, Grand Slam equation. This is something that we look at uh, at least daily, if not multiple times a day. And uh, if you have a pen, uh, feel free to. Uh, we would love for you to chug along. And so, so this uh, this equation. So you know, we have we have a few different revenue streams, but our main our main revenue stream, going back to uh, you know how much uh, G was highlighting it, is uh, is the reoccurring stuff. So we use this to to basically project um, our our current state where the facility is at and and where it's going based off of certain metrics. And um, you know, there's there's different equations and formulas we use to uh, to project and, and see where we're at with the other revenue streams. But being that this is the most profitable um, and most scalable revenue stream, that you know, we thought we'd share this a little bit with you guys. Exactly. And something that we love about it is that it is simple. If if uh, your metrics and your systems are not simple to use, simple to update, then you're probably not going to use them. So uh, this framework only has three variables. We'd love for you to follow along. Uh, and it is just three different ways of looking at inflow versus outflow. And the first way that we look at inflow versus outflow, I'm going to draw a big line over here, uh, is just customers in versus customers out. So let's say, uh, just using some simple numbers, let's say every month you gain 10 new customers uh, and lose, let's say, uh, 10%. All right. This first framework allows us to understand just where are we at? Are we growing or are we shrinking, right? So if we are gaining 10 new customers a month, uh, but losing 10%, uh, we're going to cap out at uh, 100 customers eventually. And, and if we're currently at, let's say, 20 customers, that's awesome. That means uh, eventually, if we keep doing exactly what we're doing, we're going to get to 100 customers eventually. However, on the flip side, let's say we're at 150 customers. If we're at 150, then we know we have a customer inflow problem and we're going to shrink to uh, 100 members if we keep doing exactly what we're doing. And the only way to change that is either increase this number, so get more customers in, or decrease this number, right? Lose less customers. And this is a way to really simply understand where are we at right now? Is yeah, so working. Yeah, so basically, uh, um, you know, if if your um, the amount the outflow, um, you know, the basic business terminology would be your your churn rate. So if you have a high churn rate, it tells you, um, all right, what do I need to work on the business? Uh, how do I make it more sticky? How do I keep customers longer? Um, that comes with creating a better product and service. Uh, maybe throwing some more add-ons to your offering, et cetera, et cetera. And then if your inflows, if your inflows poor at that given time, then you double down on marketing. Uh, if you have the systems that support it, you can see which which uh, streams of marketing are working working better. And then you just triple down on those to to grab more traffic. Exactly. And using customer inflow and churn, you can understand and kind of focus business strategy. Uh, the second metric or way we think about inflow uh, versus outflow is through customer spend. So let's say uh, our average customer spends uh, $1,000. That is a easy number uh, to multiply with. So let's go $1,000. Uh, and again, if our churn is 10%, right, we're losing 10% of our customers every month. This means that our uh, every customer that we bring in is worth 1000 divided by 10%, which is $10,000 in the long run. Right. And one way to kind of think about this, right? Uh, let's say you only had 10 customers, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Right. If you're losing 10 uh, every month, you're going to kind of lose one person. And this new guy uh, that just came in here uh, is going to stay around for 10 months. Every month, they're going to pay this $1,000 a month. Right. So uh, in total, they're going to their, uh, they call this customer lifetime value or LTV is going to be $10,000. And this is a super important number. This is something that we talk about all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, if you understand your your customer lifetime value, you know, um, and there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that play into that, but for the simplicity of of a membership, um, and you know, these are theoretical numbers here, but uh, um, 
you're able to to see how much a customer is worth every single time that you get one um and that allows you to to identify how much you could spend to acquire each customer so what's their what's your what's your customer acquisition cost and, and the more that you could spend per customer i mean if if you have a facility right next right next door to you and and they they can only spend or they don't even know what they can spend to acquire a new customer and they think it's fifty dollars but we feel pretty comfortable spending five hundred if we're bringing in ten thousand dollars over the lifetime value then um it's it's a lot easier to uh to acquire them exactly exactly and then the last way that we think about uh customer inflow versus outflow is kind of combining uh these two metrics right so if we know that every member we bring in uh, is worth ten thousand dollars in the long run, right? And we're bringing in ten thousand, uh, sorry, ten new customers every month. That means we are bringing in uh, about a hundred thousand dollars. And again, all theoretical numbers, a hundred thousand dollars of new customer value every month. And if we keep our churn right at ten percent, we know. Uh, using kind of the same math over here, uh, that our theoretical max uh, revenue per month from these customers is going to cap out at a million dollars per month. And what this tells us is, again, just another way to understand uh, per month. Per oh, month, yeah, per month. Per month, yeah. yeah. And um, what this tells us, is, right, is if we keep doing exactly what we're doing, eventually we'll hit this number. It's a very large number. Uh, just because the numbers I chose. But I think what we like about this is that sometimes, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, when, you know, when, you're sure, when you're absolutely grinding, uh, bringing in 10 customers a month doesn't really feel like a lot. Uh, but what it helps us understand is kind of see the horizon and understand that you know, the work that you're doing, uh, the systems that you're doing, uh, putting into place will pay off in the long run. And eventually, if we stay the course, we keep doing what we're doing, we will eventually hit this number, uh, whatever that ends up being uh, with your numbers. And it's really, uh, I think, morale boosting uh, for a lot of things. It's something that we discuss as a team. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, all this stuff allows you to see your your, your, your hypothetical cap on the business if, if you stick to those exact same numbers. So you're able to go back in and, okay, so we need more customers and our current our current ways of marketing and, and driving traffic to the facility isn't working. So let's, let's go refine these systems. And so, you know, kind of leading up to us switching to Swift, uh, we were putting these, we were putting these systems together. So we've, we, we have very robust systems for every tiny little thing. We collect data from every Avenue that you could possibly think of um, to allow us to make sw slight tweaks here and there. But um, it's it's a never ending game. It's a loop. Uh, if you could keep it simple like this, it you know provides you an uh, immense focus. Um, and uh, I think that's the uh, that's it for the oh let's let's talk about the uh, kind of the golden. Yeah, we'll throw in a little bonus here. So uh, obviously, this sounds uh, truly excellent. Uh, getting a million dollars a month um, in the long run. Um, but kind of going back to what we were saying, when you have your your kind of you know, you're in it, you're grinding. Uh, growth really looks, right, it's, it's uh, they call this logarithmic growth. Uh, but it goes here and then your max is out here, right? Uh, because this 10% churn, uh, this 10% of customers that you're losing every month uh, is a bigger number, the, the higher your total number of customers is, right? right? So when you're starting at zero and you're adding, let's say 10 customers, uh, losing 10%, losing 10% of zero is zero, right? So you hit 10. Uh, the next month, you add 10, so that's 20, but you lose 10% of that 10, right? So you're at 19. And so every step becomes a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller. And realistically, uh, just due to kind of seasonality and, and just kind of natural shifts, right? Uh, you'll hit a, a max probably somewhere around 90 to 95%. Uh, somewhere around here is, is kind of what your, your average will end up being. Uh, but one of the ways to uh, increasingly raise this roof is uh, what we call the golden ratio uh, or negative churn. Uh, and Kevin will uh, explain a little bit more about the uh, golden ratio negative churn. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, for every customer um, that comes in, let's say, 
So if every customer comes in and they if they refer two customers, and and if they were to lose a few, it's ten percent. So that would be you know that'd be twenty percent compared to ten. Uh, you actually get a negative churn. So you, you turn your your customers into your sales team, um, and you're able to do that through referral basis. And if you understand your your customer acquisition costs, um, you can really leverage this this process. So let's say let's say um, our customer acquisition cost is five hundred dollars. Um, if we allow our you know our current customer, our current member, um, every time they sign somebody up, we give that customer a $250 discount and the the member who refers them a $250 discount. And then, I mean, we're doing crazy stuff at this point, like, um, you know, throwing a bat or throwing this or whatever it is to incentivize our current members to, to, uh, to create referrals for us. And that allows us to, to never have less customers than we did the month before, um, to keep it simple. Anything else you want to add there? No. All right. Smashed it. Sweet, sweet. Um, all right, let's hop off this whiteboard here. All right, cool. And then uh, one, one, a few more, a few more points. Uh, the main one is, you know, we uh, we came into this process, and uh, you know, this was our first, our first small business get going. I'd say that we have a pretty good pulse on what's going on now, but uh, it's pretty easy to get the shiny, shiny object syndrome, where you know, um, I'm sure everyone else knows that there's. There's a hundred things you can do to produce revenue at, at a facility. I mean, it's uh, it's crazy. But if you if you can't identify which one is most profitable and, and triple down and delete all the rest, then you'll never be able to be successful. Um, and so what we're doing with with our current membership is, you know, we're, we're following these these simple principles, uh, creating very robust systems to allow us to execute on them at, at an efficient pace and turning our customers into. Um, our, our sales team for us. And, you know, in the, in the end, we're trying to attract more customers, um, increase the revenue per customer and, and keep them, keep them around for a lifetime. But, uh, once we do hit that cap, then it's like, all right, what's the next, what's the next source? Uh, cause there also, there will be a cap, um, based off the of square footage and how much, um, space you have, um, within given hours. And, you know, there's, there's some math involved there, but eventually you can only have so many members that you could support. So then you're going to have to transition to, to stuff uh, that would be a little bit more applicable for facilities that aren't on the membership model um, on programming. So packaging together a pretty sweet offering to, to sell high ticket items um, within, you know, basically the name of the game is how much revenue can you bring in per, per cage per hour. Um, and if you do, if, if the membership approach is the best, route to to get early profitability uh you get that first and then you you allot certain hours in the day package together um leverage some some softwares um like you know the futures app uh those guys have a pretty pretty unique uh pretty unique software where you, where you can create your own videos and a whole bunch of stuff that you package together create a, a higher offering um but uh so yeah focus is huge you know i would, I would say if you are Trying to do 20 things at the same time, especially if it, if one of those 20 things is scheduling. Uh, don't do that. Pick one thing, triple down on it, and be really good at that. And then once you're really good at that, maybe throw in one more high ticket item. Uh, but keep it simple. And for the lessons uh, and the rentals, all that stuff's automated. If you have coaches doing doing lessons, you just go in. Um, you know, you teach them how to to plug their hours and when they're available, and then all the customers can just book in. It's fully automated. So I mean, that revenue stream you don't even have to look at. Um, same thing with like tiny classes here and there, but it's kind of the just, and, you know, we, uh, I think one of our competitive advantages is, you know, it's obviously it's, it's, uh, it's huge being able to, to be on Swift, but Swift has allowed us to unlock doors to create other systems, um, that are, you know, are, are the core functionality and, and, and core, um, fundamentals of, of being able to scale. And we're very confident that they can be applied to every single facility. Um, it doesn't matter, big, small, whatever it is. Uh, we're very confident that, you know, at, at least $20,000, somewhere in that ballpark. We don't know exactly, but we can boost profitability. And uh, I think when we conclude this, um, you know, we, we love helping people out. 
Uh, we'd love to communicate with, with some of the people and talk about more of the in-depth systems and maybe some other strategies to to scale fast uh, as we have. So uh, I think I think towards the tail end of this, there's my phone numbers on here, uh, my email as well. But hey, feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any questions on anything whatsoever. Love the chat, talk some strategy, and and you know maybe maybe throw in some of these systems and facility and and, and see how it works for sure. So uh, I'll throw that, throw it back to G. Um, I think that's that's all we want to cover and, and share with you guys with the uh, the amount of time that we that we have. Sweet. Okay. Awesome. So we are at the tail end of this talk. Uh, I loved hearing what Kevin and Jared are doing. You can tell that they're taking a very quantitative approach to the facility business, and it is uh, clearly you know reaping rewards. So uh, now just to wrap up, I know we have questions in the chat. The last thing I'll mention here is. Since you joined the webinar, of course, there's a little promo for you, for anyone listening. Um, if you do decide you want to move forward and use Swift to automate a lot of the strategies and tactics that you heard today, you can just scan that QR code on your screen or visit the link below. Um, and if you book a demo before, you know, next Friday, it'll actually ask you like, where did you hear about us? Just drop in ABCA webinar and you'll get one free month on the platform, regardless of what plan you go with us. And you also get an engineer or staff to your account to help you migrate all your data if you're coming from an old tool as well as onboard. So we'll take care of that all for you because you took the time to come out and listen to us. And like Kevin mentioned, you can reach out to him and Jared for, for any questions and, and best practices and just advice on how to sort of implement some of the tactics that we heard today uh, in your business. So their phone number and email is also there. But uh, yeah, I think I think we'll we'll sort of pause here and look at the chat now to, to answer any questions. If you... If you guys do have any other ones that you haven't dropped in the chat, use the time now. We do have a few minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just going to go through the chat here from the top. We have people in Richmond, Virginia. Nice. Uh, Michigan. Okay, cool. All right, let's get to the first question. Um, Jim from Nevada has uh, a question. What are the best ways you found to increase top of the funnel? I agree memberships are big for our business. So I'll speak to this a little bit and maybe Kevin and, Chan uh, Kevin and Jared, you can chime in here. Uh, for our business, as well as for the facilities that use Swift, I think referrals is a huge, huge portion of it. Uh, they have do like we have one facility that uses uh, a community group. I think it's called Rewind or like it's, a, it's essentially a Facebook group where they communicate with their potential customers and they use that to get people to refer to each other. You can do a bunch of things here, but I think getting your customers to be your advocates, like Kevin mentioned, is huge. And then, of course, Google, I think, especially because you're a brick and mortar business. Being able to rank higher on Google, whether that's through content that you write or even through you know paid listings that you can get someone to help you out with, I think that will make a big difference when people are looking for batting cages or baseball facilities near them. Kevin and Jared, do you want to add anything there um, to that question? I would say uh, we kind of talked about it mostly, but there are a million uh, different ways that you can increase the top of the funnel. Uh, just to name a few of the things that we do, um, you know we do. Facebook ads, we have Instagram, we have TikTok, we do all of the things, uh, but we didn't start there. And uh, if I could only point to one thing to focus on and get really good at, it's developing a solid referral program. Uh, kind of going back to the negative churn, um, if you can turn your customers into your salespeople, um, that is that is the best way to, to do things. And um, you know, my guess is that everyone here already, uh, you know, the reason you started a baseball facility was to invest in the community. And if you can kind of uh, turn that and turn your customers and, and turn that passion into uh, its own kind of uh, referral machine, uh, I would say that's that's the easiest way uh, to kind of grow that top of the funnel. Uh, most bang for your buck. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's uh, when you when you get into the business, initially uh it's really built off having a good product and having being a good personality um that only takes you so far uh because as you scale you know you're, you're just getting crushed and having to fulfill the needs to everyone so if, if you don't have um a, a platform like swift um and the systems that that surround that then you know it's uh you want to be the one driving that um because you know at the end of the day you want to turn you want to turn the business into a machine where if you fell off the face of earth uh, it would still be able to scale. And and a huge part of that is referrals and, you know, a, a slew of other things that you can support with uh, all the all the automations that that support it, um, you know, 
automated text, emails, plug in different stuff. So sweet. Okay, awesome. Let's keep rolling here. A couple more questions about packages. Jim uh, asked, can you assign packages to customers if they come in person or do they have to book it online? You can do both. So in the admin side of Swift, you'll be able to assign the package directly and charge for that if you wish, you know, if it's a walk-in. Related to packages, Randy asks, is it possible to have credits apply to multiple types of services in your platform? Yes. So we, we've seen this often where people will create packages for specific kinds of lessons or all lessons in their, in their facility or specific kinds of rentals. You can apply those restrictions as you like. Uh, Laura has a question for you guys. Uh, Kevin and Jared, what tool did you guys use before Swift? We used uh, we used Easy Facility, and um, you know we've we've used a few other. Or we've looked at a few others, um, and they all they all kind of run into this the same issues. Um, and you know Swift is it solves all the problems that those other softwares impose. And I mean you can't unless you unless you have it you can't really can't really implement anything else. So. Uh, not a huge fan <laughs> of uh, of easy facility for sure. It's uh, it's taken a few years off my life. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, all right. A uh, couple more questions here. How do you balance the lifetime value with the cash flow on a month to month basis? I think that's for you guys. That is a great question, Jim. Um, so uh, I will answer it in in two ways. So the first one, uh, obviously, the uh, grand slam equation that we walk through. Uh, the reason that we like it is it's a simple way to understand the big picture uh, questions, right? This is something that we use to answer uh, just the toughest questions that we have as business owners, right? What is the strategy? What are we doing? How are we currently doing? Um, and so in that sense, uh, that's the reason that we like to uh, use customer lifetime value um, in, in that way. But there is certainly a place, uh, obviously, on the month to month. Um, you know, you're not going to gather that entire uh, lifetime value at the beginning, unfortunately. Uh, so we do do um, just have a, have a different way of modeling things and in kind of a monthly cash flow basis. Um, but you do hit uh, kind of my second point. You do hit an interesting um, point where uh, a tactic that we do use sometimes uh, is gathering a uh, significant portion of a program or a membership commitment uh, up front. And uh, what we, you know, it does two things. Number one is it allows us to gather a larger portion of that lifetime value at the beginning. Uh, and also what we found is that uh, the type of customer and um, the commitment of the customer is significantly higher, uh, actually. Uh, there seems to be just better buy-in, um, more commitment. And, you know, when someone commits to getting the reps in, <laughs> uh, they generally get better. And, um, you know, there's, you know, you don't just become a major leaguer in one day, right? Yeah. And, and as you know, we're, we're not trying to just get people on the membership and, and not show up. Uh, the goal is to, to create a product that's going to, to, to get, to get kids and players as, as good as possible. And, you know, when you, when you're committed to that and the entire culture is committed to that on delivering that, that premium product and service, uh, it turns, turns your customers into your marketing team because like uh, same thing as referrals, word of mouth is, it's it's incredible um and you know we, we we don't do a whole lot of spend but when we do do spend it's usually when we commit those those long-term um um uh, sales where they prepay um for the next six months and then we can use some of that cash flow especially if if you don't have a lot of cash flow to allocate towards marketing uh to go do more of those and it's never ending loops you're always ahead of it sweet I think we have two more questions and we'll wrap up. I know we're running a bit over time. Um, Max, so this one's for you guys as well. How many square feet is your facility and how many cages do you guys have? Uh, so it is, uh, I think it's like 18,000 square feet. It's a little bigger uh, for sure. Six cages uh, with three mounds in the bullpen and uh, a little turf training area as well for ground balls, catch play, agilities, all that good stuff. Sweet. And then last question, I think I'll take this one. Uh, Jim says, we have over 4,000 customers on our roster. Can you market all of those? We've been around for several years. We're currently using Easy Facility. We're looking at so Jim looks like he's like the next Kevin and Jared in the making. So um, yeah, we can definitely help. We've brought facilities over with eight, nine, 10,000 people in their roster and, and it's been fine. We have a pretty established process. One thing I tell people is 
if you're looking to switch for them, it's like a really scary thing because it happens once, maybe twice in their life. Uh, but for us, we're doing this every week. So we have a very clear playbook on how we help facilities transition over without affecting them, their staff or their clients. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Everything I see in the chat. So I'll just wrap up maybe just by saying thank you. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. I think the point of this was to make sure that you guys got at least three pieces of very actionable advice that you can take from this webinar and go implement in your business, whether you're using Swift or whether you're consulting Kevin and Jared or not. I think uh, hopefully this webinar was helpful in helping you guys just make more money at the end of the day. So I will uh, sort of hand it off back to Kurt. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for listening, folks. Thanks, Jeet. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, special thanks goes out to uh, to Jeet, to Kevin, and Jared uh, for an awesome presentation. Uh, sure sounds and, and looks like uh, Swift can do a lot of a lot of good for uh, anybody running a facility. Uh, just a reminder that this webinar will be posted to the ABCA video library tomorrow about midday. Um, we really appreciate everybody's time, everybody joining us tonight, and uh, hope everybody has a great night. Amazing. All righty.